last night again it's uh, i mean climate change is upon us yeah yeah definitely um am i is can everybody hear me properly yeah yes okay um i'm just uh, going to have to um replenish, replenish my tea cup now and then with from this beautiful tea um flask that i got this morning on my desk <laughs> thank you very much it was so nice to come to the office and there were gifts <laughs> Yes, we are glad you liked it. <laughs> it's quite an exercise to sort of get it everywhere across the globe. Thank you, Thank you so much. Beautiful. <laughs> so I'll begin the session. Uh, good evening to everyone joining. On behalf of the KVDF team, I welcome all of you to the D Talk by Ilse Wolf and Rahul Mehrotra. I'm Rushikesh Shah, a recent graduate from SEPT University, and I'll be the host for today's detox session. To give a brief background about the forum, KVDF is an annual student-run forum at SEPT University, Ahmedabad, India. Started in the year 2000, the forum is celebrating its 20th year this time and has always strived to critically question the discipline of architecture. Kurla Worki Design Forum brings together final year projects from various architectural schools to foster discussions on current debates, this year focusing on the role of architects in the evolving context of intertwined complexities of human non-human, architect client, privileged marginalized binaries that have inherently influenced the practice and discourse of architecture. This year, the forum triggers questions of how some of these binaries are now becoming more diffused, leading to a necessity to reassess architecture and how it is practiced. Detox at KVDF include presentations and insightful dialogue with two professionals from the field who share with us their journeys and fascinating experiences in the world of practice, research, and more. The two speakers will share their work for 20 minutes each and post this, the forum will open up to dialogue and questions. The speakers for today's talk are Ilze Wolf and Rahul Mehrotra. Ilze Wolf is an architect, scholar and a writer based in Cape Town. She co-directs Wolf Architects with Henrik Wolf and is based on the architecture of consequence. They believe that there are many ways to be an architect and is constantly inspired by how people inhabit spaces and the narratives that come out of those contexts. Ms. Wolf is also the founder of the research and documenting organization Open House Architecture. Ms. Wolf graduated with a BARC and received a MPhil in Heritage and Public Culture from African Studies Unit from University of Cape Town. Her graduation research was published and is an award-winning 2017 book titled Unstitching Rex True Form, The Story of an African Factory, a biography of a Cape Town modernist garment factory and its entanglement with societal constructions of race, gender, and space. Ms. Wolf is the co-founder of the publication and research platform Pumplet, Art, Architecture, and Stuff, which focuses on black social and spatial imaginaries. Through the practice and with her colleagues at Wolf, their space in Bokap has hosted exhibitions, interventions, publications, and talks in collaboration with artists, activists, and scholars developing an enduring public culture around the city, space, and personhood. The work of their practice has been exhibited at the Venice Architecture Biennale, Luciana Museum of Modern Art, Denmark, and the Chicago Architecture Biennale. Some of their works include 66 Great Moor, Vredenburg Hospital, Indigenous Systems, and Red Location Museum. I would like to welcome the second speaker of the day, Rahul Mehrotra. Rahul Mehrotra is an eminent architect, urbanist, and educator. Mr. Mehrotra studied at the School of Architecture at SEPT in Ahmedabad and graduated with a master's degree in urban design from Harvard GSD. 
He founded his Mumbai and Boston based firm, RMA Architects in 1990. The firm works at various scales and across typologies from interiors to architecture to urban design. Its clients include governmental and non-governmental agencies, corporate and private clients, and institutions, which creates a rich exposure in various realms. Paralleling this work is the firm's not-for-profit division, RMA Research, which undertakes research projects related to architecture and urbanism in India. Currently, he is the chair of Department of Urban Planning and Design at Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. With a distinguished career as a practitioner and as an academic, Mr. Mehrotra's practice teaching and prodigious writing focus primarily on housing and urbanization, particularly in Mumbai and India. Some of the firm's work include a software campus for Hewlett Packard in Bangalore, library for the School of Architecture at SEPT in Ahmedabad, and a conservation master plan for the Taj Mahal. Some of his writings include Bombay, The Cities Within, Kumbh Mela, Mapping the Ephemeral Mega City, and another recent book titled Working in Mumbai, RMA Architects. Briefly speaking of the structure of the evening, Ms. Wolf will present her work post which Mr. Merotra will talk about some of his ideas, after which we will take up questions from the audiences for Mr. Merotra and Ms. Wolf to answer and discuss. To get the most out of the discussion and opportunity to ask questions to Mr. Merotra or Ms. Wolf, I would urge the audience to make note of any curiosity or questions emerging during their presentations and type them out in the Q and A chat box. Interested audiences could request to come on board and discuss with the speakers. I would like to invite Ms. Ilze Wolf to present her work. Well, thank you very much for this invitation and for assembling this um, wonderful platform. And I'm really, really happy to be part of this forum. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, may I take a moment to just share the screen? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, just give me five minutes, five seconds. Um, okay. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. So the title of this talk is um, around a recent obsession of our of our office. Um, and also an ongoing consideration about how we are and how, how, how do we practice. The idea um, and the title is borrowed from a poet and uh, American thinker called Fred Moten, who in turn borrowed it from somebody else called um, Manolo Callahan, who is an educationalist in Los Angeles. So, Renewing our habits of assembly is trying to string together a few ideas that um, has been instigated by Fred Moten firstly, and then extended by a woman called Katrina Majit, who I'll introduce a little bit later, and then also leans on the work of writer Bessie Head and writer Zoe Wickham, both South African or Southern African feminist um, creative writers. The house that Katrina Majit built in this photograph would be 30 years old this year. Paul Grendon captured her house, captured her building her house, a Ronde Hays, in a place called Sundrift near Steinkopf in what is today known as the Northern Cape, about 
170, 200 kilometers from where our office is in Cape Town. We see in this image that she's building a house from, from materials gathered from around her and she uses a physical strength to bend the frames, which would later be enshrouded with woven grass mats. The mats will cover and shield against harsh sun during the day and cold nights, cold air at night. But what we also see are her belongings and a person, perhaps a family member, already inside this construction in process. In other words, she is building around what she already has, with what she has gathered, and around what she has gathered. At traditional architecture schools, um, particularly the one that I uh, come from at the University of, the University of Cape Town, we do not learn about this particular intelligence of building. And if we do, it is often framed as a tradition of the dead and lost past, rather than a practice of a living present. Also, when we learn to make buildings in architecture schools, the, tradi the traditional curriculum often demands that we conceive of the new building as a potential new and empty space, later to be filled with things accumulated over time. The idea, the very powerful and dominant idea of the tabula rasa or the so-called clean slate dominates the standard curriculum. Empty sites, vacant lots and open land is assumed and often a prerequisite to fill with new innovative ideas held together with walls that would divide up the service spaces and the served spaces, the public spaces from the private spaces and the living spaces from the resting spaces. Clarity and order is equated with elegance and sophistication. But what we see in this photograph is a demonstration of a particular habit of assembly, a knowledge of construction and a method of gathering that does not easily distinguish between what is gathered and who is gathering. There is no linear notion and distinction between when is the time to gather and when is the space ready for gathering? Instead, we see a construction of life where both happen simultaneously alongside each other and with other things. The water tank, for instance, is captured linked with the construction of the Rondehaze and not apart from it. The simultaneity of all orders captured in the image is a design intelligence worthy of paying attention to if we are serious about building new freedoms, new worlds, and new habits. And then to quote from the poet Fred Moten, he says, like I said, I think for me, that's what that poem is about, of what Manolo says. We have to renew our habits of assembly we have to really practice getting together and that double sense of the word practice, you know, it's a praxis. It's a thing that we engage in constantly, but we also have to keep trying to get better at it. We have to renew it. We have to regenerate it. So yeah, that's it. It's a renewal of our habits of assembly. I don't know. I feel like that should pretty much be our only object of study. So for this talk, I, like I said, I borrowed from Fred and from um, others and extending um, the practice of Katrina Majit in this photograph in order for a renewed practice of space making and space thinking. I propose the word assembly in this case to mean both to gather as people and as species but also assembly as in to put together the space for gathering. We imagine ourselves simultaneously as being assembled and that which is assembling. What are these habits then? How do we practice these habits of care, develop networks of collective freedoms and find sites of refusal and joy that exist amidst and often in spite of violent spatial um, you know, terror, 
predatory capital and ecological violence. And can we finally, can we, uh, can a collective spatial practice around renewal itself be renewed alongside these reflections? If you look at this photograph um, of a man called David Jack, who is um, known to be the initiator of the waterfront in Cape Town, where we did a building called the Watershed. In this photograph, and I unfortunately do not know who, who is the photographer of this, of this particular image, but it was a photograph that was in the media during the 1970s when there were many proposals of housing developments for a racialized Cape Town being proposed. And David Jack is here amidst a kind of a public participation process, showing off one of the models for a neighborhood that is called Mitchell's Plain. But you can see in this in this image, you know, the architect is very much sort of showing, um, the, you know, the potential people that would be living in in these spaces, you know, uh, how and how to live and how in, in in that way to make a neighborhood. The woman that he is uh, showing to the uh, the woman in the front of this, uh, you know, um, gathering of people, uh, I haven't been able to identify, but. Um, the author Zoe Wickham has written a story about a woman called Moira and I'd like to sort of think through maybe potentially this could be the figure of Moira who um, is visited by a friend who comes from um, you know uh, studies overseas to a new house that Moira has just moved into that has been offered to her by the apartheid state but it is very much seen as part of a new racialized um, neighborhood for people that were racialized as colored. In this figure, this, this image is a collage image of a project that we did that was exhibited at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. But it essentially, it's a very long story, which we don't really have time for today to really get into. But it is essentially a story about a writer, Bessie Head. And in the photograph, you see Bessie in the forefront, together with a friend, Bosele Sianana, who was part of a collective um, that produced a, a garden, a communal garden in the country that she adopted as her home country, which is Botswana. Bessie Head was very well known for writing about um, particular strains of spatial violence that she experienced and um, was, you know, um, you know, seeing other people um, witness, was witness to kind of intense, um, you know, racialized and racial violence in the, in the 1970s and the 1950s in which she grew up. But the story about this image and the story about the garden and the story about Bessie Head's house that she built in 1969 is again this idea that despite all this kind of really intense violence and, um, and erasure of people's um, spaces and networks, you do find a kind of a refusal to be passive agents and passive re receivers of this violence through the work of Bessie Head and others and through the work that they created despite such brutal um, systems of oppression through spatial violence. So for me, it's really important to just think through, um, you know, when, when, when you introduced this, this forum, there was a mention of the word binaries, but I would like to propose this idea of simultaneity that these things are simultaneous, simultaneous, sim, sim, uh, simultaneous in terms of um, the kind of you know events that happens in our past, and potentially our role as architects is to pay more attention or pay attention to that um, simultaneity, simultaneity of forces of um, of our of our cities around. Um, how we do things, but not just kind of think through these ideas of of um, of, of in, as as binary forces. And again, um, this last image is something that I find myself returning to because it is an, an 18, 1800s painting done by a painter called Charles Doyley, and it captures kind of early 
early settlement at the Cape, which is down the road from where um, we practice. But it, it also talks about, again, this idea of simultaneity, where you have the colonial construct and the colonial architecture as the backdrop to very different kinds of settlement patterns um, by people that were brought in as enslaved persons in service of the colonial, um, the colonial structures. But what you see in this image is a, a, a kind of a strange array of, of practices. Firstly, you see a group of people under what was called a, um, a, um, a, a particular kind of structure for trade at the time. Um, I forget the name now, but it will return to me. But people are assembled under the structure, which, which um, they probably made themselves. And there is visible commerce um, happening in the structure. Um, but in order to enter the structure, you are, you know, you have to kind of introduce yourself in a humble way. It is, it, for me, I can't, I, I can't figure out whether the person who wants, who is approaching the structure is perhaps, uh, you know, coming to just um, be part of the setup or coming to actually buy some of the things that are for sale. But you can see the gentleman right in the middle of the, of the image is sort of, you know, um, looking at the person approaching with a little bit, a little bit of suspicion. So in order, so, so the thoughts around this image for me is not completely concluded and I, I'd like to have a discussion around this and the other ones that I've shown is this idea of, you know, um, a kind of assemblage of, of emotions and people and, 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 and gestures. You know, for me, humility and grouping and um, commerce, despite a kind of a backdrop of colonial, quite um, forceful colonial enterprise um, is happening in this image. So again, um, the idea of, um, of a kind of, a, um, you know, simultaneity of things is, is coming across in this image with the various groupings of people in and out in and out of the structures. Some structures are ad hoc, some structures are very formal and, um, and captures a, a kind of a, a density of being. So I hope, I mean, this is a kind of a broad array of, of ideas around renewal habits and, um, and simultaneity. I purposefully didn't really delve into the kind of projects that we do because I think that the, the ideas that we that are presenting today is really kind of an underpinning of some of the some of the ways we actually make form and make buildings and 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 kind of discover how can we begin to think of society as a kind of assemblage of um, various um, modes of being. You know, Drogov talks about this idea of, um, you know, in, um, you know, this idea of um, infrastructure as, um, you know, we've all become sort of um, infrastructural beings. And I need to, yeah, I need to understand how can we begin to work as architects to recognize and pay more attention to um, simultaneity of, of, of things. So I'll stop there and um, I'll, um, I'll hand over to the forum to just kind of, um, yeah, I think, I, I think the idea is to sort of broaden and to, and to have a discussion around specific ideas. So let me just stop there and hand over to Rahul. I'm very happy to share this platform with. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, now I would like Rahul to pre uh, present his ideas. Thanks. Uh, you, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, sir. You are audible. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ilze. Uh, that was, as always, uh, provocative, fun, lots to think about. Uh, and thank you for you know putting all those sort of questions uh, on the table. So what I'm going to do is not use so much time, I hope, uh, that you've allocated with us. I don't mean this as a critique on the time Ilze took. She was very brief and tight. Thank you, Ilze. It leaves more time for questions. But, you know, I, I think uh, I, I kind of want to, in an other way, pick up uh, and extend uh, two thoughts that she is sort of very beautifully articulated. One is, you know, uh, and the, uh, uh, um, the renew our habits of assembly. 
but also I think the notion of simultaneity. And I think the way Ilze framed uh, simultaneity as a way of getting away from the binaries because otherwise we live in uh, one or the other binaries and actually create other forms of polarization. So I wanna kind of um, frame this and these are things uh, I know, at least with Ilze, we've exchanged very often. So excuse me, Ilze, but in every context, I think all our ideas evolve in, you know, the, in, in different ways. So the three, the three um, uh, thoughts, uh, I'd call them, that I'd like to sort of elaborate a little bit on is this idea of the context um, and what one means by the context of the context, uh, because uh, that idea is related to simultaneity in some ways, because that's another way of instrumentalizing how we can get away from binaries in a sense. Uh, and I think that is a, a big question and a lot of ideas that Ilze has already spoken about, I think I, I'll you know, try to address there. And the second is, I think the question, which I think we began to discuss uh, two or three days ago in the earlier discussion that Ilze and I were part of, and there was Himanshu and other people, which is um, uh, uh, the instrumentality, which is if, if we want to aspire to what Ilze is describing, uh, really, where do we situate ourselves? I mean, is that also a matter of renewing our placement within society, correct? Uh, and I don't have the answer for that. I just want to raise that as a question because that becomes, you know, in the same way as you describe uh, what becomes tabula rasa, what is imagined as an ordered landscape is a process that actually emanates in the way the architect then is positioned in society, perhaps. Uh, uh, I mean, they're linked. I'm not saying that's the only factor that propels that, but they're kind of linked. So the second question I just want to put for our discussion is this alignment uh, with society. And the third is, uh, again, no answers, just observations on what is collaboration, because that's one of the questions the, uh, uh, the KVDF has raised. Uh, and uh, we talked about, which is also implied very deeply in what Ilze has spoken about, because although the protagonist is a single woman here in those very beautiful images, uh, it is, it's, it, it's it, even collaboration in the same way as the role of the architect is so singular in an imagination. What does collaboration really mean? Uh, collaboration is something we do all the time without realizing it when we're responding to a client's needs, for example, but we don't make it a collaborative framework sometimes and we make it a binary in a way, way that it's the architect and the client. So I think deeply implied in, uh, in say, the provocations you've made is also this question of uh, in collaboration, interdisciplinarity, uh, transgressions of you know disciplinary values maybe, I don't know. But so those are I think the three buckets that I just thought I would you know, uh, just put up here for discussion. So let me just start with the, you know, the the idea of the context of the context. And uh, I think this is very much linked to simultaneity and breaking away from binaries. Uh, because uh, if uh, as architects, um, and I think this is for me, the deepest uh, aspect of the provocation that uh, Ilze has made is we we look at, or we traditionally through pedagogy and all understood the context as the broader physical environment um, of a given site uh, and the comprehension of which is extended through, you know, wider parameters uh, that we try to discern such as, you know, climate, maybe culture, uh, maybe the embedded history, some of us are more ambitious to do. Uh, and in a way, uh, I think, uh, again, the embedded history is, I mean, I think uh, Ilze turned it on its back and started with embedded histories in a sense as, as a way of excavating some of that. Uh, but I think this uh, reading is potent and, and it's dynamic enough for designers, you know, to sort of understand broadly the world that we are intervening in. But, but I mean, I think it, it, it yet isolates and it yet limits our understanding of the site tremendously. Uh, if we have to aspire to the kinds of things that Ilze has put on the table or challenged us, or challenged us uh, to do, even just the act of renewing our habits of assembly. So therefore, I think the provocation or the, the proposition here is that if we nestle the context in its context, we can potentially create a much more nuanced reading uh, of, uh, uh, 
of you know of what we we understand and i think in in a way while it is a incredible broadening it can also make our interventions more precise um, as professionals and designers uh, and so how do you then take the context which is largely tangible there of course many intangible aspects of what we've traditionally defined as the context and you place it into this much more expansive uh, context of what's around us is and therefore then it becomes very critical and contingent on us to produce the kind of uh, meta narratives uh, so to speak that might help us do that uh, and and of course these uh, uh, these can get sort of incredibly wide uh, because you know uh, I, I mean it could be all the way from questions of the urbanization of poverty and what are the processes that link uh, that sort of lead to that of course politics in its simple form the alignments ideologically uh, of 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 whoever is in power or whatever community is making the decisions where uh, you're understanding that context so of course there are ideological questions like that but there are also other more tangible things like for example migration the processes of which might be more complex but uh, the idea of what I call flux, uh, uh, how do we kind of deal with flux? Uh, how, do we, how do we understand the facts, say, in a country like India? Uh, I'm taking that case um, specifically because I'm kind of familiar with it. Is, you know, we, we have like over 100 million seasonal migrants, uh, for example. Uh, you know, what, is, what does that mean uh, with regard to the form of our cities? What does it mean with regard uh, as systems of mobility and communication increase, uh, the small towns that surround our mega cities? There's a whole uh, landscape that surrounds that one site that you operate in, whether you're doing a house for a rich person or you're doing a piece of social infrastructure. The flux of the context, context, that means the context of the context, actually is the only way one can anticipate the relevance uh, of, in the future uh, of what you're producing and what you're intervening in. And so it's really contingent upon us uh, as architects if we want to break away with the, from the binaries, if we want to address uh, the challenge that Ilze has posed to us of looking at simultaneity as that category. And you know, the way I would frame it is the simultaneous validity uh, of, uh, of the many forces that you read, because otherwise we, we filter out, we curate out those, and those are the biases that are embedded uh, and that we are programmed through our, um, uh, our education, of course, with some people learn to deprogram themselves, de-schooling society, Illich's famous book. Um, uh, but they also, you do that kind of curation sometimes uh, out of vested interests, your own survival or uh, you know, other contingent forces around you. Uh, but if the discussion and if the tools for us to uh, squarely embed in any process that we, uh, we trigger, this ambition of, 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 of uh, interrogating the context we are working in, in its, more, in its more specific orientation to the broader context that it sits in, uh, I think uh, architects will not only have uh, more powerful, or let me not use the word powerful, power is not a good word to use, but will be more instrumental or will have greater agency in the way uh, they also function within society. Uh, but it also, this, this broadening uh, that I'm kind of suggesting uh, is linked also to the other two points, which is what is that position that we have in society, but also how we can engage with interdisciplinarity. So to, to move to those, um, and then I'll come back to this, which is that it, it's, it's only with that broader understanding that and, and recognition of forces and issues that are even going to in sometimes not so discernible ways uh, um, uh, impact the site or the little context that you've defined uh, is, is very critical because it helps you broaden your own constituency of folks you want to engage with. Yeah? So uh, you know, I, I think they're kind of linked in the way who you even consider the client, right? I mean, a simplistic way of saying this is our client for a little house we do is the client, but then is the neighborhood and that street our client too? And is the city our client too? And is then the planet our client too in the way we use resources, right? So client um, just with the baggage it's carried has become so narrow uh, as a term that it actually 
it, it in a bad way uh, uh, focuses um, our attention, our energies, and our concerns. More importantly, it's a narrowing of our concerns, and therefore, uh, you know that that classic dichotomy uh, between the sphere of our concerns and our sphere of our influence. Uh, don't intersect, and they can only intersect if you bring the context within its context, because otherwise our spheres of concern are expanding exponentially, uh, you know, all the way from climate change to poverty to justice to, I mean, we are, as architects, we are worrying about the whole world and every problem that exists there, but our sphere of influence is actually diminishing. Uh, and so a lot of the cynicism that appears uh, whether it's among graduating students or even within architects, um, is because there's a great disjuncture between our spheres of influence and spheres of concern. Uh, and this is squarely linked uh, to the notion of simultaneity, to the notion of being ambitious about placing, uh, you know, the context we operate in and using the broader context to inform every decision uh, that we make, right? So, uh, so I think this alignment with what is a client becomes very critical. And as a sub point in that alignment, I just also want to put on the table that really one is beginning to feel more and more that you know civil society around the globe today is perhaps a, 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 a well, let me say a category or I don't know what the right word is, uh, which uh, uh, needs greater attention because it, it is a bridge between what you might call grassroots and more powerful forces, because generally civil society comprises of, of that part of society that has the empathy for the marginalized, the empathy for the grassroots, but it has the wherewithal to negotiate uh, and, uh, and, and call out more powerful forces, right? So ideally the media, labor unions, uh, you know, these are all formations of civil society in a sense, we use it more liberally to, to actually allude to the elite who are empathetic to the grassroots. But this is a category which, you know, had, trade unions are civil society. And so the, the question then for us is, if we do set the kinds of ambitions that, you know, Ilse has provoked uh, this idea of simultaneity, the context of the context, the negotiations between many and multiple forces, then architects must see themselves as part of a civil society. And with that comes the incredible responsibility of making this bridge uh, representationally, but also in terms of empowerment and instrumentally between the grassroots, the disempowered, the marginalized uh, and more powerful forces, because we have the ability to translate, say the implication of planning documents or the implications of zoning, the implications of bylaws, uh, and what it might do to the poor, uh, the implications of a large public infrastructure project, which is going to cause forms of displacement. Some of it might be inevitable, but then you jump into anticipatory mode, which means how do you preempt that with alternatives uh, or other forms of alignment? And you know that that is very absent in many parts of the majority world or the global south or whatever category you want to sort of describe where we are all situated. And so. The second point that I was trying to make was this positioning of the architect if we set up these ambitions. And I think uh, there, uh, I think civil society imagining us as a bridge profession uh, or a bridge practice, bridge disciplines uh, is, is, is very critical because look what's happened. Otherwise we are operating in silos. Uh, conservation for one, I've always argued is but an instrument. Uh, uh, it's it, but a planning instru instrument that helps any society modulate the rate of change. Now conservation has become a silo in itself uh, and you know it's detached from planning and how can that happen because it does impact the built environment. Yes, of course, through urban conservation and legislation, they overlaps, but it didn't emanate there. So these sorts of disjunctures also, I think we need to be aware of. So therefore the idea of the bridge becomes very important because it's not only a bridge with different parts of society, it's not only a bridge with different disciplines, but it's also a bridge within the kinds of nuanced forms, the professions that now are concerned about the built environment have separated their conversations and their cultures and even their values uh, so much, yeah? So I think, and then the third point, which I kind of wanted to make uh, was the question of collaborations and interdisciplinarity. And, uh, you know, I mean, of course, there are some very obvious things there, which is 
uh, the complexity of the world and the complexity of often the problems we deal with, because if we are trying to simultaneously for our own nourishment, understanding, judgments, values, place the context within its context, we have to depend on many other disciplines. We have to depend uh, on many other lenses uh, to see the patterns of the problem in the same way as, uh, you know, I mean, Ilze started her, uh, her, her uh, uh, presentation uh, by borrowing uh, and discerning something she sees through the lens of a novelist or a photographer. I mean, that photograph told, uh, I mean, she just needed to use one photograph to talk about that whole process. Um, and so these are different lenses that we've got to become uh, more adept at. And pedagogy has a big role in creating those exposures, but because it, not, for, not for becoming uh, uh, conversant with that discipline per se, but using that discipline uh, and that lens uh, to really inform the decisions that you make as an architect uh, about implications, decisions, forms of assembly, uh, etc. Uh, and so I think uh, 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 that that collaborative kind of culture, uh, which is connected to interdisciplinarity, I think comes from actually defining uh, the problem uh, appropriately. Uh, and you know, and I'll just give you a, a small example, which I tend to use a lot because for me it's been it was the moment where I realized this, which is working on the Kum Mela at the university. And I remember preparing for it for a whole semester. Uh, we had six schools at the university, all the way from public health to business to engineering to design, and within design, three disciplines: Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the School of Religion, Divinity. Uh, you know. Uh, all of us preparing to go to the Kum Mela and no one, not even the architects were prepared for what they would see. And so therefore each discipline felt susceptible, actually felt, uh, uh, felt disempowered uh, to understand the problem, which opened up their, uh, they became empty vessels which could receive in a sense, uh, which allowed that kind of collaborative interdisciplinarity. And often it comes from the way you define the problem. Uh, often the problem is defined through the bias of our professions. And if you do that, then you can never let that context embrace the forces of the larger context because you've already created the wall of, 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 of discontent and of exclusion uh, in the process. And so I think these are uh, just sort of, they're all linked. I mean, the idea of simultaneity, breaking away from binaries, then taking the context and expanding its understanding, even that little, little, let me call it a hut, although it's a dome and we go with a different definition, at least emblematically of a hut. But even that, the construction of that little object uh, was much more sensitive to the forces of the context and its context than what you see in a suburban house sometimes, you know, uh, that an architect produces. Uh, and I think this is what Ilze was trying to discern in those readings, uh, that these were forces of nature, forces of human instinct, forces of, you know, practices and, you know, traditions perhaps, uh, and just compulsions of survival too. Uh, and so uh, I think um, you know, that sort of is very much linked or really questions where we stand in this equation, where do we stand then in society? And my proposition is that at least a good beginning would be to imagine the notion of civil society in an expanded way. And then in defining the problem in the way by intersecting the context to the context, uh, you already become uh, much more equipped uh, and open uh, and you see the productive and the necessity uh, for interdisciplinary in interjections uh, you know, to do all of this. And I just want to end by just saying that maybe what we've talked about and both Ilze and I've put on the ground, you, you know, you've seen images of leaves and branches and someone building a hut out of, you know, little sticks and, uh, and someone pointing to a model on the waterfront. And, and I'm kind of even abstracting this further without any images. But the question is that this is very linked. And so let me give you one or two examples that might just sort of uh, trigger off the conversation. So one, you know, let's just take migration, let's just take flux. And I'm, I'm, I, I don't mean to get so banal, but it's important to make that bridge to what does it mean for architects, no? Uh, so if you just look at migration and we look at flux and we look at what's happening just in India, and we look at the fact that there are over a hundred million seasonal 
uh, migrants you know, or people, I, I don't even use the word migrants, this reverse migration that's being used in India because of the pandemic is, is quite sick because uh, you know they, they're all within, they're all Indians moving within the country and we make it feel like they're crossing borders they shouldn't be crossing. But let's say 30 million people, at least according to the IIM figures that I read, uh, 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 was about 30 million people went back in those couple of weeks, walking back, taking buses, you know, all of that. So it, it really, this is a real thing, correct? But yet when we look at pedagogy, we look at any imagination of housing, look at the metrics we use, we assume that it's a nuclear family and on the scale of their own income, it becomes a one bedroom hall and kitchen or a two bedroom hall and kitchen or a three bedroom hall and kitchen. And if you're even richer, then you get a villa or something like that, correct? That is actually not the market. That's why you see so much high-end apartments and all just lying vacant on the periphery of Indian cities and many parts of Africa too. Uh, this is happening when new towns are built in this sort of global suburban model, right? We should be actually imagining different typologies of how people could live in this sort of state of flux. I mean, suddenly for me, the youth hostel, the YMCA model, the dormitories, all of that, co-housing, cooperative housing, forms where people can share habitation in new configurations become really the problem. So that's the problem we've got to really define. And therefore then from that extends the question, how do you find space for it? How do you find land for it? How do you find the patronage from it? How do you actually convince the government to change policy, to accommodate this, et cetera? And there's a whole, then, then the problem becomes different in terms of what we crusade for as professionals and who are the alignments that what are the alignments that we make to make this happen right as as participants in civil society. So housing typologies is one already. Why within schools of architecture, are they yet concentrating on the metrics and the ways of imagining housing and its aggregation, uh, so to speak. Uh, it was relevant when I was a student in the late 70s and early 80s, but maybe it's not relevant now. Maybe we have to think about it differently. Uh, and uh, you know all of that. The second related to it and just related to my own interests and work, is also understanding these fluxes in the way then we, uh, to extend uh, Ilze's, uh, or for me to, to, to provoke Ilze in a, uh, in a constructive way, is we've got to also uh, renew our habits of disassembly uh, because you know, assembly is one side of the coin. Uh, and how do we actually imagine places uh, how does zoning even have a category for a temporal zoning zone, which means that there are parts of the city which uh, attribute uses only for five-year cycles and actually can change those uses in the way you know you have informal markets around Law Garden in Ahmedabad, which has been formalized on a temporal scale. But how do you do that actually with space in the city? Of course, this gets into land markets. It gets into the politics of land and real estate. And I mean, a whole lot of things, which again, one will have to address if one sees those as a solution. But the starting point is for architects to make this imagination. For architects, we were talking uh, the other day about how modernism had the arrogance of imagining a brave new world, uh, and that was rejected by society. We have to find other more relevant, sensitive, um, sustainable ways of making those new imaginations, uh, which is what will then drive society's imagination of these places. We can't wait for society to come to us with those briefs. Uh, and so therefore, uh, all I wanted to end with is saying is that for each one of the categories I've described, and I'm sure Ilze has described, we can actually connect it to a problematic that one can address in very tangible ways uh, as an architect. And that's how I think uh, the context nestles in its context. Uh, we address the notion of simultaneity uh, in both the values we discern, the problems we understand and how we react. Uh, and we, you know, I think uh, allow this sort of intersection between our spheres of concern and our spheres of influence by expanding both at the same pace and not really out of proportion in the way they exist, which is what I think um, creates a lot of frustration within the profession. And I think that's what we need to reverse through conversations like this. So thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Merudra. That was a wonderful um, uh, presentation of your ideas. I would like to open the discussion to Ms. Wolf and the audience. 
so until people type in their questions, uh, I have one question uh, for uh, Miss Wolf and also um, uh, Mr. Merotra. So while we are talking about please call me Ilza. <laughs> yeah, and please call me Rahul. I was going to say that it's very tedious. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, so while we are talking about the renewal of habits, as well as the idea of the context, uh, there is a question that popped uh, in my head that radical advancements in the society like Uber and, and Zometo, let me say uh, the more capitalist uh, advance, advancements. So they are rapidly changing our cities and the ways that are beyond visual. Uh, but the architecture of our cities is not uh, necessarily transforming or adapting at that pace. So how do you see the architectural profession keeping up with uh, these rapidly transforming needs of our cities in the coming future and then thereby the changing needs of our society? Thank you. I mean, that's a very, very difficult question. And I don't know if I have ultimately the answer, but I do want to just think that maybe, um, you know, the, the profession of architecture is uh, a kind of, one needs to understand that it is a, um, a construction that was constructed, you know? So what happened before, how did, how did buildings and cities develop? before this kind of institutionalized um, system and this professionalized notion of the architect and architectural practice. I've, I've started talking about spatial practice more broadly, um, and that allowed us to think through who are, who are spatial practitioners in both the sense of thinking space and making space, um, and hence the kind of, uh, you know, lure towards um, people who write in books and document because a lot of the time I find that the neighborhoods that I am drawn to study are not they don't exist anymore except in sorry it's very noisy outside except in in in, in literature you know um, and uh, so um, when you ask the question about um, how can how, how can architects you know intervene broadly, I think it's it's to think through exactly what Rahul is talking about. How do we begin to engage civil society as as spatial practitioners, as active people that that have um, not not necessarily the disciplinary um, you know focus that we as as professional architects have in order to kind of you know implement the materiality of architecture the materiality of spatial practice but who definitely have thoughts about it would definitely have a track record of making meaningful spaces um, within maybe even pre-existing buildings or you know the way people uh, make spaces you know and i'm sure this is a very very common thing in your context um, i i think that there is a kind of a uh, stuckness on the fact that we are an isolated isolated system of, of practice and system of thinking and there is, there is the broader society but I think that there could potentially be a set of ecosystems that overlap and, and, and intersect in very meaningful ways to produce systems and sometimes architectural the architectural ecosystem is not even part of that system that's making spaces um, and sometimes we are so I think the, for instance, I just had a, um, a moment around thinking about ecosystems because we as a, as, an, as a practice produced a film. We've made a film and um, it's something that we were able to do. I know he's a very good photographer. We can tell stories. We are interested in architectural research. So the film was produced by our office, but we are by no means filmmakers. We don't belong to that ecosystems of filmmakers. We now take the film to, you know, uh, how do we, we don't even know how to fund filmmaking. We don't even know how to take it to festivals. We don't, need to, we don't know how to speak to people who make this. We have the habits to make films. We know the habits of making buildings, right? but it doesn't have to be these isolated things. So we've become friends with filmmakers just to, in order to learn how do we actually make this? How do we actually make this happen? You know, so, um, so then, yeah, so it's, it's how do we intersect these various ecosystems to, to do the things that you think is meaningful 
to kind of refuse Google's interventions. You know, you mentioned Google and you mentioned these big conglomerations, but in Cape Town at the moment, there's a huge controversy um, right on my doorstep where we live, where um, the Amazon headquarters are going to be constructed on sacred land. You know, sacred land meaning that they were, uh, it was land not just sacred because of ancestral belongings, but sacred because it's on a floodplain. You know, a, 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 a eco, it's, a, it's, a, it's a potential ecological and ancestral violence that is potentially going to happen. And the owner of Amazon, George Bezos, is completely unaware of, of the consequences of, of this particular intervention that's happened. Architects are not even involved in this conversation in terms of, uh, you know, how we can imagine or influence differently. We haven't been asked. We don't uh, participate in the broader conversations. It happens. You know, it happens uh, despite our involvement and um, or our non-involvement in this case, as a profession, I'm saying, you know, I'm just as a profession, not our practice in, 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 as such. So I think there's a, there's a system, there's a thing of, yes, one needs to be, I think, and this is something that you, you mentioned, Rahul, around how can pedagogy, how can um, if the episteme of, of spatial practice be more involved in actually training uh, or just, you know, allowing thought processes to, to percolate um, in, in, in design schools. And we do have a stuckness around, around in the, in broadly in the architectural training around, you know, on the one hand, making professionals for the profession in service of the profession. And on the other hand, coming into the world and things happen despite our involvement and, and, and with our involvement there, you know. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I, I do want to also just, you know, extend on what Rahul is talking about, about civil society and engaging civil society in the various systems in civil society and, and disciplinary boundaries and not being so precious about our disciplinary bounds, but also use our dis disciplinary skills in service of, um, of, of, of creating ecosystems of meaningful production of space. So Akshar, can I jump in? I just want to extend some of the things that um... I mean, I think I totally agree with what Ilze has sort of answered your question, but I want to pick it up in from kind of another perspective, which is, I would say you're using Uber emblematically. Uh, that's the context that you're having this discussion that's worrying you. You're, you're, you're sitting in the context of Uber, let's say Lyft, Uber, whatever the different categories might be. But, but broaden that for a second and ask the question of, the role of the digital in cities. What is the digital doing to cities? And then it extends to many other things and many other possibilities. And it, it then points to, I think, what the word Ilze used, the ecology, right? What is the ecology? Then the digital can help network that ecology. Why should, if it works with Uber, why can't it also work with water delivery? Why can't it also work with 20 other domains uh, within uh, a, a city? It, then it can work with managing ephemeral uh, uses uh, of space, uh, because, you know, uh, there were many things that one imagined, which couldn't be done because they were pragmatically not possible to make operational. The digital suddenly opens up much space. So if we talk about zoning and we say that we want to manage a city plan, which also has temporal cycles, now you can do it. Uh, because digitally, someone can go with a phone and swipe a post there, and you'll know if you have a booking to use that space for the next week or you don't, uh, and it can be implemented, right? And so then it, and this is why every question you asked about a site, so for me, Uber is your site, and what is the context that site sits in? Uh, and then suddenly it opens up and expands things differently. Uh, and I think that is really how we have to think about this. And I think, uh, you know, Ilze ended her comments by saying, how does one embed this both in pedagogy, but also in ways we engage civil society? Because if we broaden our constituency, we broaden our clients and we look at even what the client is in a more complicated way, uh, we'll challenge ourselves in different ways. Now, Mr. Manat Singh has a question to us, Ilze, where he says, oh, you, he's here, so he can say it himself. Hello. Yes, please. Um, um, thank you for the enlightening discussion. Firstly, I was struggling to keep up, but I'll, I think I'll go back and uh, re uh, again listen to some of the things that you guys have said. My uh, question is pretty direct. Uh, 
I wanted to know your thoughts on something that uh, the architect Louis Kahn said. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just read it out. I'll uh, quote him. I was brought up when the sunlight was yellow and the shadow blue, but I see it clearly as being a white light and black shadow. Yet this is nothing alarming because I believe that there will be, there will come a fresh yellow and a beautiful blue. And that revolution will bring forth a new sense of wonder. And now this is the less cryptic part, uh, which is my question. Only from wonder can come our new institutions and they certainly cannot come from analysis. What do you feel about uh, what Mr. What architect Louis Kahn has said? Uh, can I can I maybe jump in, bro? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go on. Go on. Um, I, I don't know. I think it should be both, right? So like wonder as well as analysis, you know, um, how, why, why do we need to choose between the two? You know, um, I think that one needs to kind of move between the two. Um, and I think um, to say that we must wonder in lieu of analysis is to lose the one or the other. So I think, I mean, one needs to do both and try and do and also be precise about when is the one appropriate and when is the one um, not not appropriate you know so uh, yeah i mean uh, i think um i i am very sort of uh, i find that analysis tends to be the dominant kind of um, you know method methodology when it just comes to looking at context and looking at the site and, and analyzing but you need to also be to, to have that small sense of curiosity and wonder to begin to see how ecologies be, can potentially overlap, right? Um, so wonder is allows one to look not just at you know, the climate and the plans and the section and the planning regulations, but wonder allows it to look at literature, for instance, and music and poetry and think through, you know, those are not the two kind of, you know, obvious things to think through when you are looking at context, but, um, you know, there is a kind of a infrastructure that is embodied within the context that, that requires some level of wonder. And, um, yeah, so I think it should be both, you know, um, not one or the other. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, Ilze, you put that really well, uh, and I completely agree. Uh, you know, it's it's like the, it's like designing anything. No, it, these are reiterative processes, right? You wonder, wonderment leads you, and you make an intuitive leap about something that you become excited about, and then you go back and try to make it work, and then you get stuck, and you make another leap, or something else inspires you, right? So it's always back and forth, and uh, again, uh, you can't separate these. If you if you didn't use analysis, you would have uh, uh, an institution which might re represent your wonderment and no one else would relate to it. But the analysis might tell you how you have to broaden those agendas to include other people, to bring in you know, other perspectives, which enriches it. And, and institutions evolve, right? Uh, all of this, so, you know, and institutions are linked to identity, they're linked to culture. You know, all these categories, uh, whether it's identity, culture, institutions, these can't be seen as static, uh, they evolve. Uh, even your identity is not a found entity. Your culture is not a found entity. You construct it. We are constructing a culture of conversation as we speak because these questions are so specific, correct? So institutions are like that, and they have to be a well-calibrated uh, balance uh, between uh, you know, what are objective decisions and what are subjective decisions. The objective decisions allow you to gather a group of people and have people buy into it and you move forward and then you get a leader who makes a subjective decision and has a vision and you lose some people and other people come on and the institution moves in another direction, right? So it is this reiterative process that um, it creates the evolution of institutions. I, I also, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, your words Rahul, around flux and migration is so important to think about, you know, uh, the kind of mobility of things and the kind of non-stuck. But there's also this kind of false sense that complexity, uh, messiness, simultaneity is harder you know it's, it's, yeah. it's just too hard to, to think through these things and these and i think it's a false kind of sense in many ways um and i think that it's it's probably you know this kind of need to control that makes it harder i think if one leads if one thinks through uh, a sense of, in, of of embracing complexity embracing flux embracing change 
it, it just it just you know it, there's a permission then also just to embrace um, non-power and non-control. Um, but I think as soon as one has to make these choices between um, you know you know these various choices around um, you know what was what um, wonder analysis. and and an analysis, there's a kind of a sense that if you choose the one or the other, then you have control over the one, how it, ha how it happens, right? So I think that there's a sense that maybe as, as architects, we need to just embrace non-power and the power of it, you know, um, just to, to not be able to have to control. And I think it's, it's a very deep psychological uh, sense that that our training has sort of said to us that you know the architect controls or you know the architectural profession can control the environment in particular ways can we I mean I don't know you know so the kind of move towards what is what it is not the sort of the, the move towards simultaneity flux migration um, you know uh, this idea of assembling around things that you've gathered is also an embrace of not wanting to control. So Falak Naz, you're going to ask the question or should I answer it? Uh, no, you can answer it as you have read it. No, but you might want to say it in your own words. We'll be yeah, happy. So basically my question would be how and how do we start catering to the housing issues that we face today in a set city like Mumbai? Uh, I personally, in my opinion, I believe that we are catering to a very selective portion of the society and not catering to the larger portion of the society, which actually requires housing and it takes it as their basic necessity. Uh, so how uh, how and where do we start catering to this mass, uh, uh, mass masses? And especially in our scheme, I see that the end users, they are not very much friendly with the lifestyles that we get. For, for example, I have a slum in my area and they do have a new uh, developed building that is not in the city, a bit outside the city, and they have uh, kept it on rent and they are still here. So we are not really solving the issues of the slum redevelopment or anything. So how do we cater to such issues when our design is not for the end users in the end? So the short answer to your question is understand the problem better in the way Ilze and I have described it, uh, because a narrow understanding of the problem gives you a narrow solution, right? So. Uh, what does that mean? You ask in the question of Bombay. So first of all, let me start with a very fundamental lesson, which is that, uh, you know, I mean, the, the holy trinity, first of all, if you look at any city, 80% uh, of the fabric of the city is housing, yet architects talk very little about housing these days, right? 90% of the fabric of most cities is housing. Uh, we've, we, we, our voice on housing is lost completely, right? Then the holy trinity in housing, uh, which is why I, it's, this is not, you know, I think the next question says, is this a planning problem? No, no, these are not planning. Pro these are, we've got to bring all these disciplines together. That's what interdisciplinarity is. In housing, the holy trinity, if I may use that word, is dwelling, livelihoods, and mobility. You don't need mobility if dwelling and livelihoods collapse in one space, which is what the shop house did or where homework does, etc. right? You need mobility when you need to connect places of livelihood and housing. So cities that have good mobility can actually expand out further, have land that is cheaper, have provide housing, and then people can yet very easily come to their livelihoods. In places where that system breaks down, then people tend to work in their homes. They tend to create slums, as you the word you've used, I have not used it, to be near their place of work so that they can rent out the apartment given to them on the periphery where there are no jobs and slum it out so that they can get income because that's important. So the balance between that trinity is very critical. Therefore, the best form of subsidy for housing is indirect subsidy by subsidizing mobility. So you don't have to give people cheap housing if you make mobility free, for example. And that's why governments make the mistake of actually subsidizing housing, whereas they should be subsidizing mobility, and people will find places they can live and they can come to their work, right? So the point is, so this is exactly 
simultaneity, right? Thinking about these problems simultaneously, about looking at what is the context of the context, about expanding uh, the way you ask the question, because then you frame the problem differently, which means then it means you've got to make a collaboration between X, Y, and Z to solve this problem, not as an architect sit frustrated and get cynical uh, that my influence is nothing, but look, my concerns and my values are very broad, right? That's the disjuncture which we need to heal uh, through new systematic, systemic approaches to the way the profession has been molded. Your question was very specific to Mumbai. Uh, so let me try to answer it there. If you look at the Eastern waterfront land, it's 1,800 acres of land that's been lying vacant now for two decades, right? Uh, there are slums in some part. The government could have easily made housing there, which was time bound till they could come up with a more comprehensive plan. If you look at the new plans that they've made for the Eastern waterfront, there's no mention of this kind of thing, right? So this goes back to what I had highlighted at the end of my presentation is if we accept flux, if we accept new categories, and subjectivities uh, and um, uh, you know uh, ways of looking at uh, the the problems of the city. Then we'll think about typologies that are different. We'll think about new formations of urban design. It will not become the standard uh, way of using the metrics, which projects like that do. Uh, if you look at New Bombay, uh, you know the government owned, owned all the land. And that was a unique thing about New Bombay when it had been proposed by, you know, Shirish Patel, Charles Correa, and Praveena Mehta. Uh, it was a unique case anywhere in the world that a city of 3 million people, the government had the ability to do whatever they wanted because they had acquired the land. And what has now the government done over the last 20 years? Given it to Reliance Corporation, given it to, you know, SEZs who are now going to convert them into university campuses to leverage the money on the real estate, which as with no investments that they are making. This is devious. Uh, and so, so there's so many ways we can imagine uh, how uh, housing can be addressed. Uh, and I think it has to start with the way that our profession, in which society invests a lot of money to train us to imagine better spatial possibilities for us to dwell and live our lives. We have to find ways of making those imaginations, of changing the conversation, of defining the problem differently. And this is where I think what both Ilze and I have spoken about, the categories, the ways of looking at it, it this is the kind of shift we need because then we'll define the problem differently. And it's really, you know, it, it, the answer you get depends on the question you ask, no, finally. And so we've got to right now start asking the right questions, I guess. Now, and, you know, not to say that this is not for the first time we are asking it. There's a whole history of these voices, right? They get lost. Sometimes we have to just revive these voices. And that's also part of the excavation you have to do as another generation. Go back and see what were the voices that resonate. Some voices, you know, for me, for example, sites and services, which got a terrible name through World Bank projects in the 70s and 80s, is actually incredibly relevant today because the state can't provide and deliver housing. Uh, and uh, maybe that time was too early to have sites and services. If you did intelligent sites and services today uh, and had processes that allowed people to engage, people will help themselves. It's much easier. The digital can be deployed in fantastic ways to um, empower people to do that. So there are many histories which you have to also excavate because they begin to have relevance in another time, albeit you will have to transform them, be inspired by them, going back to Mr. Manat Singh's question. You know, this is how institutions are formed. They, it's inspiration and objective analysis. Uh, so there, there are many, many things you can do, but the starting point is to define the problem broadly, more correctly, and in more relevant ways for the time. Sorry. So, Jay, have we, Jay Kapadia, have we answered your question, yeah. or do you want to yet frame it differently? Yes, sir. It is actually in the ongoing conversation itself. Like, as you were talking about that, uh, we as an architect can also involve in policy making about different aspects that how our voices are sometimes maybe unheard or left out in certain important aspects. So that was my question. Like I have been also working on some different project uh, was uh, about conservation. So I thought that the places where architects are not involved right now has also some potential to work in the future aspect that their role can actually talk about something important 
which is often missed out in the bureaucrats or also the authorities that they make certain policies so how we can enter like from academic to professional when we do the projects at in the professional level how we can enter and how we can uh, like we can convince them that the discussions which we are talking that how so that i'm uh, want to, wish to know Ilve, do you have any advice? I have. I have a one-line quote that I would just use and hand it over to Ilze. Is I don't. I think that's an anxiety you shouldn't worry about. No, Gandhi said, "Find purpose, and the means will follow." Right? If you don't find purpose and you're looking for the means or the processes, they'll never arrive. So I think it goes back to the previous question on housing. Find the. I mean, define the problem. Then, uh, the, the, whether it's policy, whether it's the institutional framework you need around, those are means. those are all the means but if you don't have purpose those means will never emerge i also think that um you know we as the architectural profession should maybe through analysis also to see what are the appropriate you know intervention an intervention doesn't necessarily mean a material intervention it could mean a set of uh, conversations that you put people together you know for instance the housing the housing debate the social housing debate in south africa in cape town specifically is currently led by um legal processes probably more than spatial practitioners spatial practitioners are are um kind of a second tier you know third tier sort of um you know professional sy system within that ecosystem but the main concern around social housing thing and holding government accountable for not um getting rid of well located land in the city is through land specifically um land legal frameworks right for me that is a very important spatial practice but it doesn't necessarily have a material materiality linked to it yet you know it pertain it has the potential to unlock very imaginative material forms neighborhoods and material consequences but the 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 power of it at the moment lies within the legal framework and i think one needs to also think through the situation and this, this maybe goes back to the conversation around housing in mumbai which i obviously know very little about but is how do we how, architects often center themselves within the problem at the expense of potentially more uh, you know uh appropriate skilled professionals um to make real interventions so i think it's it's maybe part of the kind of conversation a con part of the training of of young architects and continual training for myself definitely to think through and really ask your question is architecture required number 1 <laughs> and if it is what is the most what is the most appropriate you know architecture you know an architecture meaning could be conversation it could be a um you know a literal collab like putting two big ecosystems together in the same room to get something done you know i think it's very architectural you know so 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 these are these are other kinds of ways of at first humbling yourself and then analyzing exactly what is required because you know we all want to make things <laughs> we all want to make things and sometimes making things is not the right thing to do you know uh, but you they definitely needs to be something done and what is it you know um yeah so i, I don't know yeah if that could maybe a, extend some of the thoughts on the as as a sound bite as, as a sound bite i can i mean this is partly in jest but partly seriously as a sound bite i can summarize uh, ilze's uh beautiful thoughts by saying that sometimes architecture is the problem not the solution yeah yeah exactly okay so we have one more question sorry yeah uh poonam parekh uh, i guess she's asking me drawing from the concept of whether the role of people in space country would would be your approach well and well let me just sort of uh, how did the study of the kumela influence the design practice i think they're both kind of linked so i'll i'll in say if you don't mind i'll jump in and take it you can add to it Not a uh, yeah so uh, uh uh you know i mean i think for me um, I, i'm just trying to connect the, these last two questions 
Uh, you know, the, 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 the writing on the kinetic city, in fact, was uh, expanded in when we were doing the Kum Mela, and that's why that book was called Mapping the Ephemeral Mega City. So, and it became a book called Ephemeral Urbanism. So kinetic, to make kinetic as an idea more expansive, one used the word ephemeral and to make the city more expansive, one used urbanism, uh, just to be able to embrace, go beyond the artifact of the city, urbanism as more processes of making, because what is urban, rural, these are also image-based. And so the way those are linked is the influence that, the Kummela had, uh, they, I mean, th that's a whole conversation in itself, so I won't go there. And there were many, many lessons, um, which I'll, I'll try to point one thing out, which is also linked to the first question on how does one get then inspired by these categories, right? Uh, so here are two things that uh, might be useful, at least I'm conscious about in what we are doing now and thinking about things. One is, um, uh, you know, the notion of what we've already discussed, which is reversibility and the ephemeral as also a management tool. One of the things we learned in the Kumbh Mela was even the governance structure was on a temporal scale, which means the, the, the people in charge shifted at different stages of the festival. So it wasn't a top down uh, kind of process, which was very strict, but it was a shifting process. And when the Mela starts, the Kumbh Mela Adhikari becomes in charge. He has to only report to one person, which is the chief minister. Uh, and he can take all the decisions. And that's kind of a suspension of power, albeit temporarily, which is also interesting. One of the reasons many of our cities can't respond to flux, can't respond to all the categories that Ilze and I have talked about, is sometimes their governance structures are older than the artifacts of the building. And they, are, they have evolved from a time where the issues were different, whether they were about extraction of resources through colonization, et cetera. So they're not nimble anymore. So we should, I mean, one of the things we learned from the Kumbh Mela was this notion of ephemerality, of temporality, of simultaneity, actually is not something that you just see in terms of tents being assembled and disassembled, but it's also how the governance structure itself and the past structure was articulated. Yeah. So it's, it's actually things like that that make an intersection. But the most important thing that one, I think, was inspired by uh, through all this sort of research, and here I kind of also attribute the framing to my colleague, Eve Blau, which is the notion of transitions. That is, you know, we, one of the, and going back to Ilze's last point, which I was a half in jest summarizing as, you know, sometimes architecture is the problem, not the solution, is that we are trained to think in absolute terms, right? Uh, we, we design weekend homes to last for 200 years. I mean, it's sort of, they get irrelevant after the kids have become 18 and have their own thing and don't want to go with their parents for weekends any longer. Weekend homes should be designed for like two decades at the most, which is a whole dis different design problem. So the notion of reversibility, the notion of how you think in terms of transitions, not just in absolute terms. And here the definition of the problem becomes important. Uh, you know, so... Um, you know, if you're talking about zoning, that's flexible. If you're talking about reversibility, even in our architectural imagination, we're talking about life cycles of materials. Uh, why can't we? Why can't we precisely design a building that's valid only for 35 years? We should be able to do that. <laughs> Which means, and that's when you won't lock yourself with temp with permanent solutions for temporary problems, right? Which is why when architecture becomes a problem, not the solution, unless you are intelligent enough as Aldo Rossi talked about the architecture of the city where it can take on many uses and recycle. So the point is you need all of this. And that's why the category of simultaneity is so critical. Cities can't just be tented cities. You can't make cities like the Kumbh Mela. You need a combination of both. So you need parts of the city that are stable, that are invested in using different time cycles and life cycles and all of that. And then you need parts of the city which are also uh, looked at to solve transitionary problems, you know? Uh, will the flux and migration go on to perpetuity till the planet is yet around? Perhaps not. Maybe in 20 years with the pandemic, we'll be decimated to half our population and it'll be a very settled state. Who knows? We don't know. Uh, and that's my point. We don't know what climate change is going to do. Uh, we are like lemmings, you know? We are all rushing to the mega cities on the coastal fringe uh, in self-destruction. Uh, with climate change, we should be retreating. 
uh, we are not retreating, but retreat can't happen overnight, right? Retreat is a transition that you have to do over two generations. You know, you can't move all of New York onto higher ground. Uh, so, so we are not in our pedagogy and in our conversations as professionals, we are not paying enough attention to the design of transition. So in the same way as renewing our habits of assembly, we've got to renew some of these impulses that we have as designers in how we respond on to even understanding the problem, but also how we react to it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Would you like to uh, respond to this? No, I mean, uh, I'd just like to add that, you know, I've been closely reading, you know, a lot of what you've written on the Kinetic City. And, uh, you know, the more I read increasingly, it leaves me with more questions so to speak, then, you know, possible imaginations of how to design for such a complex urban system. But uh, I think these are good points to begin thinking, you know, to somewhere connected with yes. about how to go about. Poonam, yeah. Poonam, one of the reassuring things I tell my students is that in today's world, if you're confused, it means you're thinking clearly. If you're thinking clearly and you have all the answers, it means you're terribly confused. So feel good about the fact that it's opening up more questions and not giving you the answers. That's yeah. very true. That's very true. <laughs> Confusion is very good. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, thank you for all that you've written about it. And it's really thought provoking. So thank you for the answering the question as well. Thank you. Thank you. After all this talk of simultaneity, I find it very difficult to listen and read the questions at the same time. So <laughs> So I'm just, um, I know there's a question by Manat Singh, but is he still here? Is Mr. Singh still around? Or maybe he can just present the question. Or I could, he left? yeah, we could. Be. No, no, I mean, I think we've answered that question. Oh, we've answered that one. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we've okay. answered, I mean, in the sense he's, he's I think, okay. restating it in terms of wonderment. And ah. Manat Singh, if you're yet listening, yes, wonderment is important. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Right. No, that's great. Okay. So, Thank you okay. also, Rahul, for that provocation around um, renewing our habits of disassembly because it talks yeah. around this idea of unlearning things, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And yeah, so there's a few things that we get stuck with and um, that I um, trying to sort of unlearn and unquestion, you know, but at the same time being very rigorous with the kind of disciplinary gifts that we have, you know. We and do actually, have to the, the integrity of the disciplines is actually very yeah. sacred. Uh, yeah. And I think yeah. what you and it's I are both very... suggesting, sorry, no, I'm saying the integrity of the disciplinary cultures and knowledge is very important. And I think yes. what we are both suggesting is not a disassembly of those, but an expansion of those uh, yes. while keeping those values very much intact. Um, you know, it's like it's like conservation, no? where you create the illusion of the architecture intact, but you might recycle yes. the inside. Similarly, yes. the disciplinary integrity and frameworks are, you know, they've evolved. They, they, they can't be done away with, but, but, but they can be further evolved or expanded or, or their culture has changed. You know, we shouldn't take any yes. of that as static. I mean, this happens in, in planning, in many disciplinary cultures, uh, they cultures are assumed to be static and that's yeah. not true they can't be yeah i've got a um i've got a, i had a wonderful teacher when i was doing the um, african studies mphil because what happened was in that program um suddenly i moved from a architectural program which everybody was doing you know the architectural thing and urban design and, and we were all focused on the built environment to the humanities where I was sitting around in seminar rooms with musicians, archeologists, um, you know, uh, heritage people, writers, you know, everybody with a different discipline. But our teacher said, you know, you got to take your discipline seriously. We, we, we can't throw it out of the door. If you want to play, if you want to play with each other as, um, as interdisciplinary professionals, you have to read architecture. You have to read the music, you have to read, the novels, right? 
uh, but it's it's through your disciplinary gaze that the interdisciplinary ecosystem really begins to harvest some jewels, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not we're not saying throw it all out. It's like how do we read it within a different um, overlapping ecosystems? Yeah, and absolutely. And then therefore, your professional training is the touchstone because that's what you've invested in. So it's really about how you use these others as lenses to see the world and then use another lens and you've seen two realities, then your job as an architect is to weave those realities, yeah. Yes. Thank Super. you. Super. Thank you all. There <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Merotra and Ms. Wolf for your insightful responses to the questions. We'll deprogram that, uh, Ilze, to Ilze and Rahul. Okay, you've got one more chance to thank us with our first names. <laughs> So the audience and the KVDF team is really grateful to have you in the Kurla Worki Design Forum 2021. And that is for the day. Hope to see you all tomorrow for the last discussion of the KVD Forum 2021 titled To Build or Not to Build, which will be followed by a culmination discussion. Thank you, Mr. Shah. Thank you very much. Mr. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was such a gift to talk to Raul and to everybody. Uh, and also, again, no, thank, you for thank you for your beautiful gifts. <laughs>